Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and violin tutor. If the violin is shaking when you're trying to do vibrato, that is the number one sign that you are attempting vibrato too soon. Number one, the first thing you're gonna need is a violin. I have been playing the violin since I was four years old. I went to university and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in music. With the amazing talent that's Alison Sparrow. Alison, come out here. So bear with me if there are any technical hitches, I'm sure it'll be fine. For about five years, I was an examiner for the London College of Music. And over the years, I've seen basically the music world from every kind of possible view, really. And because of that, it has enabled me to write my own violin course. Hello, everyone. About well. So there we go, that's kind of all you really know, need to know. And don't forget guys, anyone can learn to play the violin. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Alison, the online piano and the online violin tutor. And it's very nice to be with you all again. Just before we go into uh, the questions again, don't forget I have a 1 to 30 violin course coming up here, which you can see in all the details. They're 100% downloadable, 59.99 US dollars. The first 10 lessons and everything that you need are absolutely free, so you can try before you buy so that you know what you're getting into. The links are all gonna be um, underneath this video. And I know a lot of you here are actually following that course, so you're kind of here to get all the answers out of me um, with anything else. So let's put you back on that. Right. Let's crack on and get into it with the first question. I've got some questions coming up in the chat box. I'm not sure if it's this side for me, it might be that side for you. Okay, first question. The Happy Knot says, my violin has an old fingerboard that's getting a bit thin. If I put a newer, thicker fingerboard and nut on the vi on the nut on my violin, will the higher action make the, the violin louder? Um, I'm not 100% qualified to answer this because this is Sorry, I'm eating my own hair. This is probably something more directed towards a violin luthier. So I'm kind of, I'd kind of be guessing a little bit here, but I would assume that, I would assume that obviously, yes, if, I mean, if anything that you're changing on the violin is going to make difference in the sound of the violin, um, this is an antique violin. This is actually, it actually was an originally, this was originally a Baroque violin. Baroque violins back in the day had much shorter necks here. And what they did with this is that back in the day when they were transitioning from uh, Baroque playing, which is a very, very different style, a very old style, very different style of playing into classical playing, when the genre changed, they would rip out of the necks, rip out the necks of the violins and put in much longer ones. So this actually this violin here doesn't have the original neck piece on it compared to the body so anything that you're going to change on it is is going to change the sound you know from the bridge to the fingerboard probably not so much when you're talking about the tail piece um, and things like the chin piece but potentially the fingerboard yes you just have to make sure i think you might be opening up pandora's box a little bit when you start to change things like this because if you are ever if your action then the string action is just basically the height of the strings from the body of the violin up to here. So if that is changing, then obviously your bridge is going to need to be altered because if you're not putting on the same fingerboard, which is exactly the same and, and all this, that and the other, even if it's kind of, you know, a millimetre or even half, a fraction of a millimetre higher or lower, then that's going to change what you're going to be doing with the bridge. So that's about the extent of my knowledge on that one, but I mean, suck it and see kind of thing, or take it to take it to a professional to do it. I would think that I'm not sure whether you're planning on doing this yourself or not, but if you are planning on doing it yourself, um, it probably isn't something I would plan to do on myself. It sort of depends what the violin depends what depends what your violin is, but it might be that you just end up kind of trashing the violin and it never goes back to what it was before. And something just never quite sounds right about it. And it can sound, once they sort of sound that kind of nasally sort of sound, there sometimes isn't any kind of going back from that. So maybe just, just bear that in mind, I think. Um, I don't know if that helps or not. Um, moving on. So Ali8607 has sent me a few messages. Um, reading these, I think the crux of the, me of the, of the question was can you play the piano without having a physical piano or just by using software that simulates a piano? You're going to need a piano. 
um, when you're starting off, I know this is violin, so I'll just be very, very quick with this. I know a lot of you do actually do play the piano, but when you're playing the piano, if you're learning the piano, you ideally want to be playing with as close to a full size piano as possible. A full size piano is 88 keys. I know a lot of people play with um, keyboards, like maybe uh, 66 key keyboards and, and and they're okay they're okay to kind of get you off and going and they're okay they're okay to see if it's something that you want to continue on with but you won't be able to actually learn to play the piano fully if you were following the equivalent my my piano course which is the equivalent of my 1 to 30 violin course my piano course is 40 lessons if same same sort of thing then you'll probably find that you might only get to maybe the first uh, you'll probably get through the first book for sure and possibly the second book but then once you get beyond that you'll you'll want something more anyway but uh, to answer the question no you will definitely definitely need something physical absolutely without a shadow of a doubt okay hello Tracy nice to see you again um, right, I seem to have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just going to speak fast and try and get them done as quickly as I possible. Uh, Naomi says, as a beginner in violin lessons, will the online lessons help me pick up or will I need a teacher as well? The online lessons that I have done, which are these ones coming up here, I can guarantee you, I can 100% guarantee and I can sit here and say with all 100% confidence that my course will guarantee to take you from a complete beginner, as in you know nothing about nothing, I know that's a double negative, but you don't, you won't know anything about anything, it guarantees to take you from a complete beginner to a very decent, accomplished, intermediate player and you will not need a teacher. The only thing that you miss out from learning online is, is obviously the feedback that you get from a teacher. But getting a teacher is sometimes not particularly worth that because you have to commit to them. They cost you a lot of money. My course is just a, a one-time payment of 60 US dollars. So it's it's very reasonable. It's very affordable. Everything is downloadable. And then all the videos that, um, the videos that go with everything in the book, everything's linked in with the QR codes here and then these are actually uh these are actually anything in blue is like a clickable obviously you can't you can't click it on on when it's physically printed out but that's why I've got the QR codes there for this course is designed specifically for that purpose so this course has been designed for you guys to be learning that way but you know having a teacher is it is the best option you know I'm, I'm not going to lie it is the best option because you've got someone you can you know, someone that's physically there in the room and someone that you can talk to and someone that is going to give you real time feedback. But if that's just not possible, the next best thing are my online lessons. And I know there are a bunch of them out there, but I truly believe and all you've got to do is just go onto the feedback. It's real feedback on my website. Go onto the feedback on my website and you'll see, you know, everybody really, really likes it. And this course is based on 30 years of physical teaching so it's the culmination uh obviously I did it it wasn't I haven't been teaching 30 years and then I did it I'd obviously been teaching 20 years and then I, I wrote this series about you know eight eight or so years ago and I've been kind of building on top of that but it's a culmination of my years of teaching that I've condensed down into a book put out there in the form of uh online digital books that you guys can download and have instantly along with videos out there as well. So the only thing you miss is real-time interaction with a teacher to get feedback. But this course is comprehensive and it's thorough and it's very, very good. And it will take you from a complete beginner to a very decent, accomplished, intermediate player. And I'm always here to answer any questions or anything like that. You don't need any other resources if you don't want to, just that course. So yes, hand on heart. I wouldn't sit here and vlog something that I didn't believe in. You guys know that I don't have the ability to, to lie in that way, but I do believe in it and I wouldn't have written it and I wouldn't have put myself out there all over the internet just to get trashed if something wasn't working. So yes, it does. Um, okay. Chelsea F says, please, can you demonstrate fourth finger vibrato? I can. Fourth finger vibrato is very difficult. So don't uh, don't get yourself kind of bogged down too much with that. I'm just going to turn my microphone down in case I feel like I'm shouting at it to you, shouting down it to you. Fourth finger vibrato is very, very difficult. I would probably say, um, I'd probably say first finger, uh, sorry, first, second finger vibrato is much easier, then probably first, and then third, 
and then fourth. But let me demonstrate some fourth. I'm just going to turn the microphone down a touch. I'll make sure you can see me. So all I'm doing, I'm doing the same vibrato that I'm doing here. So I'm really just... Hang on, let me just move my microphone out of the way. It's getting in the way there. There we go. Uh, let me turn you up. So really all I'm doing is just rolling from side to side like I am here. And the fourth finger, I'm trying to roll as much as possible. Because we've only got tendons up the side here, they're not very strong because you, you don't have any muscles there. You've just got tendons that go up the side of the hand here. So you can't... Uh, you, you can't strengthen tendons, they, they just are what they are. You can kind of help strengthen the movement in your hand and make it so that you understand what it is that your finger has to do. But as you can see, I'm just, I'm still rolling the best I can. I would say that my little finger does sit a bit more flat. So when I'm doing vibrato with say the third, I would say my fingers sit, you know, at, at 90 degree angle here, and then I'm, I'm just rolling them. Whereas my fourth finger, I'll admit it is a little bit flat, but it is a lot harder to do. So that's your fourth finger vibrato there. I don't know if that helps from this angle, moving around from this angle so you can see. It's just the same, it's the same vibrato. The fourth finger is just a little bit more fatiguing. So I hope that helps, but that's all it is. That, that I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's all, it, <laughs> that's all it is with it really. Um, okay, let me know, let, let, let me know. Um, Jen W, I'm joining from Australia. It's nearly 4 a.m. here. Wow, just watching the process today. 4 a.m. Wow, that's pretty early. Um, but nice to see you. Um, okay, Chelsea, again, on the Ala Hornpipe music bar 14, are you doing fourth finger A or open E strings? I've tried it both ways. When I watch you, it plays like it, it looks like you're doing open E's. Um, hold on, let me have a look. So, Ala Hornpipe is from this book this is from songbook one so this is the book that you would go on to the songbook that you would go on, go on to after you've done the first 10 lessons um okay so this is what we're talking about and we're talking about this this measure here um i don't think it really matters whether you do a fourth or an open e i'd probably do an open e uh, yeah, I would probably do an open E. I don't, I don't always like doing fourth fingers because I don't always like, where are we? Uh, we're there again. I don't always like the sound of the fourth finger. I don't always like the sound of an open E string either. But I think with this case, it, it's either or. It doesn't matter. If that's the case, if you don't really know what decision to make, are you going to play with a fourth finger or are you going to play with an open E string? And it really doesn't matter. So I'm sitting here and I'm telling you, well, it doesn't matter. Play with a fourth or an open E. That doesn't really help you either, does it? But... The next thing that I would go to is I would think to myself, right, what kind of piece of music is this? Is this a very soft and gentle piece of music? Is it quite a loud, resounding piece of music? It was composed by Handel. So it's it's quite it's it's from a classical era. It's quite bold, it's quite strong. So why why would we not choose open E's? Do you see what I mean? So when it comes down to the fact where I've got to be sitting here choosing on a piece of music, and this goes for anything, by the way, just not necessarily this. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking whether you are going to be playing a fourth finger or an open E, for example, play it through in, in either way so that you can hear what it sounds like. And then if you're just really not sure, if you're like, well, the E string is just as easy as the fourth finger, uh, I don't really know which one to choose, then take a look at the piece of music, look at the composer, see who the composer is, see what genre he's in, listen to the piece of music on YouTube so that you can get a feel for what this sounds like. If it's big, it's bold, it's it's bright, it's loud, it's, you know, it's got everything going for it. It's, it, it's a march, which, you know, this is a nice, big, bold, bright piece of music. Then go for that open E string. I don't think it would be out of place to do that. However, if this is a much softer, slower, 
uh, more muted kind of uh, gentle sort of piece of music then I would off opt to do the fourth finger instead of having a big loud resounding E string in there because I think it would fourth finger would just be a little bit more sympathetic to the music so if you're not sure bring it down to what what is the music what would be best fitting in the whole terms of the music and then make your decision from there okay uh tessa hope you had a lovely christmas i did thank you i hope you had a lovely christmas and i hope everybody else who celebrates christmas i hope you all had a lovely christmas as well not long until the new year um okay blue rose 77 hello again uh tracy i received your course as a christmas gift i'm so excited oh wow have you started it yet let me know what lesson you're on um sir sponger doodle <laughs> sir sponger doodle brilliant i was actually just watching some of your videos um tina um, I'm referring to my post last week. My new violin is an old one from Germany and it's just awesome. It sounds great and I love to play anymore now. Oh yes, I remember what you were saying about your violin last week. Good, good. Um, SSB73Q, is it worth the money to install geared pegs on the violin? Um, no, I don't think it is. I, I just don't think it's necessary. I would, I think they're very expensive. I think you don't need you, you you don't need them if you're tuning properly. And people always ask me this question, especially guitarists, because it's so much easier with a guitar. But you've got to remember that guitars do have bigger strings and the geared pegs do work very well on violins. And I, I'll admit I have them on my electric violin, but I don't have them on this one. As you know, I've just got normal pegs in here. I couldn't imagine having them. I. I, I, I just think it's just massively excessive. I think it would be the equivalent of me buying um, a, a Ferrari when I'm just driving to Tesco and back. It, it, there'd just be no point unless, you know, unless it's my professional career. Well, this is my professional career, but you know what I mean? Unless, unless it was absolutely necessary for me to do so, just buying a Ferrari just to pop to Tesco to get my milk and potatoes and then come back again isn't really worth it. I just think it's massively overkill for what it is. So I don't, I mean, it's, it's up to you. There is no right or wrong answer. It's not like it's a no, you can't put them on violins. I personally a, I don't think it's worth the money. There was no way that I would ever put them on there because there's just there's just no reason for me to do do so. My violin tunes perfectly well from those pegs. So if you've got a violin that's already neatly set up, then you can be tuning from the pegs or you can be tuning on the, from the four fine tuners that you get there at, at the bottom there. I've only got one, but a lot of you have four across there. So the fine tuners will just help you tune it to within an inch of its life. And then if it's really badly out of tune, then obviously you're gonna use the pegs here. I use the pegs completely to tune because I feel like I get a better tune anyway. It's just, it's, it's just, it's just me. And also this peg box is set up for these to move. But to be perfectly honest, if your violin is set up well, you will find that your pegs will move the same as geared tuners. So I, I, I don't think it is necessary, you can. I just don't see the point. If you've got a violin that's already set up to use the peg box anyway, why why would you need to have them? Okay. Um, Jet says, how much in GBP? $60. Uh, I think I'm, I'm assuming that we're talking about my course. $60 is what? £45? Maybe f anywhere between 42 and 45 off the top of my head. Um, if, when you go onto my online shop, if you head into the top right hand corner, whichever way that is for you, you can click uh, the um, the exchange rate. So my shop will charge you in, um, the shop is in default US dollars, but it will charge you in your home currency. But, currency. but if you want to see how much everything is in the shop, go to the, the, the top of the website. Um, it may be in a different place on the app. I can't remember off the top of my head. And then you can change the currency. So you can sort of roughly see how much it's going to be uh, for you, but maybe about four low for 40, 42, 45 pounds, something like that. Um, Jet also says it's hard not to hit the other strings while bowing. Yes, I've covered this a lot. It's it's it, it can be a couple of things, it can be it, can, it just can be down to you. So, <laughs> plainly enough, it can just be down to you. So, you are not you don't have your arm in the right place so if you think let me just move you 
so if you think that your arm needs to be so if your your arm needs to be here for the a string and then if i'm hitting the d string my arm needs to be there the g string my arm needs to be up there so you can see my arm here this arm here has certain levels that it needs to hit in order for me to in order for me to bow so if i wanted to bow on the a string my arm would have to be here if my arm was any further down i'm going to hit the e string if my arm was any further up i'm going to hit part of the d string so it has to be exactly there if i want to hit the d it's got to be up there if i want to hit the g it's got to be up there so a lot of it's to do with your arm level think of your arm as an elevator or a lift going from floor to floor it the elevator or the lift will stop you precisely at the moment that it needs to so that when the doors open you can get out on that floor it doesn't stop you halfway in between because if the doors open then you can't actually get out of the elevator or the lift the other thing or the other issue that it could be is that it could be that your it could be your bridge isn't curved enough so you can see here that my bridge is curved uh, there you go that's pretty you can probably see that let's put you there just right behind Groot there so you can see that it's curved there and the E string is much lower down than the, than the G string so you may just need a better curvature on your string uh, on your bridge sorry when you get these really cheap student quality violins and I'm talking you know something sort of particularly not branded something more Chinese branded or random branded if that kind of makes sense then a lot of those bridges a lot of uh, a lot of those violins don't come with already kind of fixed bridges they expect you to be doing that and obviously if you're not a violin luthier then you know that's going to be quite difficult for you to do so it could just be that you need your bridge worked on a little bit as well but definitely try you know work on your arm level first and if you are if you are tr if you've tried that and you've exhausted that it could just be that your bridge needs ever so slightly altering um ali 8607 for purchasing a suitable keyboard what model do you recommend um i don't really have anything that i can recommend at the moment now unfortunately um so i can't help you on that i've um, I've not been in the keyboard game for a, a while, but it doesn't, if, if you're talking about keyboards and you, well, if you're talking about playing the piano, it doesn't matter what keyboard you buy. You just need something with a piano sound. So look for something with as many keys as possible. And you really want something that's uh, touch sensitive and weighted keys. Those are about the three things that you particularly need. Um, J pod, how tight do I hold the neck when doing vibrato? So it depends what sort of kind of vibrato that you're going to be doing. If you are, if you're holding the way I do, so there's kind of two different types of vibrato, uh, arm vibrato and wrist vibrato. I do wrist vibrato because I hold with my, the pad of my thumb right here. Some people that do arm vibrato are going to be having their thumb a little bit further up. So they're holding with the neck of the violin kind of more, more in that kind of part of the hand there, whereas I hold with just the thumb only and then my fingers come over so i don't have uh let me show you can no wrong way around so you can see so there's there's a hole kind of there's a hole in there so i don't have any contact whereas some people will have the neck do you see what i mean so right in there so if you're holding the way i do i guess you don't really need to hold it any any tighter than you usually do you just sort of you, you put you know you need to make sure you've got a little bit of a grip on it but when I play, I do tend to sort of clamp down a little bit on, on my neck. I don't have a shoulder rest, but it doesn't really make a difference. So I'm just holding firmly down here so I can let go and I'm still supporting the violin here. But I'm not particularly holding the neck any more. No, I'm probably not holding the neck any tighter. My thumb just wants to sit there, if that sort of makes sense. So when I'm playing, my thumb just moves a little bit further up or round or underneath or round so not really any tighter than you normally would. If you start gripping too tight, you're just gonna find that you're just not gonna be able to shift very nicely up and down the fingers, fingerboard, and you're also gonna find that you're just not gonna be able to do the vibrato. You're not gonna have the flexibility in the fingers to move because you're just, you're so damn tight with all the fingers. So just normal, whatever you were, whatever you were doing. Um, okay. 
Um, hi, uh, LGM Cat. Hi, Alison. Learning initially involves putting all the fingers down on a string to create a specific note. When do we stop doing this? Does this occur naturally or is this taught at a specific time? Um, I don't really think that I particularly teach that way. Not that I can recall anyway, or if I have said that, I've not intended to mean that. So I think what you're meaning is that when you're pulling down the fingers, you, you, when you're putting down a finger, you put them all down, but you, you don't really have to do that. I've never, I don't ever recall mentioning particularly anything like that. And like I say, if I have, that's not really quite what I intended. But if you want to put the third finger down, just put the third finger down. That's that. You don't have to put the second or the first finger down. Now, I do remember, and I recall now, I was actually taught that way. When I wanted to put the third finger down, I was taught to put the middle two fingers down as well. Um, you know, or the first the first two fingers down as well. But you don't have to do that because the only sound that you're going to be getting is the one from the final finger. So there is really no reason to kind of do that if, if you don't want to. So, you know, start incorporating that now if you... I mean, the only way that you would put the fingers down is if you're actually more playing um, sort of notes one after each other. And then sometimes I sort of just keep them down anyway. But if I was playing from the first to the third, I would probably just put them down naturally anyway. I'll be honest with you. It's not really something I've particularly sat and thought about now you've asked me the question. So I don't really think it's anything that I would have sat and specifically taught you about. So don't worry about having to put all the fingers down. If you don't, if it feels a bit too sort of odd or a bit too awkward to do that, then just don't do that. But it isn't a thing. It isn't something that particularly sort of needs to be mentioned or something that you particularly need to do or don't do or anything like that. Okay, how are we doing for questions? I'm trying to get through literally as many questions <laughs> as I possibly can. Apologies if I've missed any. If I have, just write them out again. Um, hi, Alison. I'm going to play Vivaldi Summer in my school annual function. And please tell me how to tackle the bow properly on each string. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I'm not entirely sure what it's seems quite specific um something that you're asking um vivaldi summer is quite a complicated piece of music so i'd probably unfortunately i probably need to see you playing in order to, to answer any question based on that i think um cursey i try to learn to play chords to play with the violin bluegrass and it's difficult to play two strings any advice for it so if you're, when you mean it's quite difficult to play, I think it's very difficult to play, to go from playing one string to two strings. We're, we're taught all the time that we need to isolate those strings, exactly what I was saying earlier. So you need to make sure that your arm is at particular levels and then all of a sudden somebody's telling us that now we have to play two notes at the same time, which is quite difficult. So I think there is no... There is no, there is no magic wand with any of that. There is, I'm just trying to think of sort of anything that I can kind of help you with apart from really, again, it's just learning where the arm needs to be to hit those two notes, uh, you know, to hit those, those two strings, really. If you're playing more, more bluegrass, then I'm assuming you're going to be more... Then I assume you're going to be playing kind of two strings at a time, and you're not going to be playing sort of spread out chords quite so much but again it's just it's it's just it's just basic practice on just playing those two strings and mixing that with playing the two individual strings um but it's just you've just got to learn where those two strings are or sorry where the arm has to be to play on those two strings And just keep that nice and consistent as as you're bowing but that's kind of it really there isn't any i can't really think of any kind of magic tip um that's really going to help it's but again it's just all about just keeping that arm consistent once you found the bow has hit those two strings and the bow is on those two strings then you just want to keep the arm at that nice constant level so i guess it's just about keeping that arm there and not kind of wavering that arm up and round because if you're doing that then obviously you you are then going to hit other strings 
Um, if your pegs don't move, peg paste. Yes, you can use peg paste or you can use like a bar of soap. I think I talked about this last week. Um, Sir Spongadoodle. I mean, it's just worth it just to say that name again, isn't it? Uh, when I practice vibrato, the bowing itself sounds really scratchy, but when I'm playing normal notes, it's fine. Is there any reason? Uh, not seeing you play this, but from what you've described, I can only imagine that once you are concentrating on vibrato, your bowing has gone to pop. So it might be worth a little video, videoing yourself. I know we all hate doing the videoing, but just video yourself so you can just at least see what the, zoom in on the arm, so you can at least see what the arm is doing. I can only imagine that what's happening is, is that when you're playing normal notes, your, your bow is fine, your bow is perfect, it's all blow, bowing in the, night, in the nice way, exactly as it should do. The second you start doing vibrato and your brain is now going, you know, uh-oh, concentrating on this, and now we're doing this, the right arm is just going, the right arm is just going off and just doing whatever it wants to do because you're too busy concentrating on this. And it's what your right arm is doing that you obviously need to, to fix. But that to me just sounds very typical of that's, that's what's happening. It's just a miscommunication between the eyes, the brain and the hands as to concentrating on the vibrato and then we're not concentrating on here. So probably what's happening is, is that you're doing your vibrato or you're playing normally. You're playing normally. And then when you start doing vibrato, you kind of, you know, maybe, maybe you're doing kind of all of this. Maybe your bow is moving or maybe you're hitting other strings or maybe your your pressure is, is too much. But it just sounds to me like it's some kind of just slight miscommunication with you having to now concentrate on doing the vibrato. So what I would do, what I would suggest that you do for that is practice some scales, choose some scales, choose an easy scale. You should be doing scales anyway. So choose an easy scale to do D major or a G major scale, something like that. They're in, um, you know, they're all in, they're all in my books. If you're following my, my book course, uh, it's in book two, these ones. It's uh, wrong. That's the back of the book. It's, it's in this one, or you can find them online anywhere. Uh, so pick an easy scale, a G major or a D major scale, something like that, and play it just on its own plane first and listen to listen to the bow that you're doing and then add in the vibrato nice and slowly and still keep an eye on the bowing. The reason why that's going to help you is because you're doing something very simple. You're, if you're trying to do this within a piece of music, you are focusing on the bow, you're focusing on the intonation, you're focusing on the notes, you're focusing on the rhythm, you're focusing on getting that piece of music out there in the air, plus you're trying to add in vibrato. So that's too many things. What you need to do is just get the correlation between your bow, what your bow is doing, and the vibrato that you're doing. So you need to take something away. So take away the complication of having a piece of music in front of you and use something basic which is like a scale everybody should be knowing how to play a scale if you're following my course you'll be doing that anyway as standard so that's easy to pick one of those up but if not get a scale learn a scale scales are very basic they're very simple they're very easy uh they're very easy to pick up and do so play a scale then you can start incorporating the um the vibrato in with that scale but you're not having to think about any rhythm or anything else. So taking all the rubbish out of it first so you can focus and then go again and see if that helps you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, we're going fast today, aren't we? Um, but I can see I've got a few more questions that I want to get. I'm trying to get through as many as I can. Claire says, hi, Alison, may I know if I have completed your course, am I able to take an ABRS exam? If so, which grade should I go for? I would probably say, do you know what? I would, depending, I would probably say you're going to be sitting anywhere around a grade four to a grade five. If you are at the top end of your learning and you've done really well with the course and you've picked it up really well, obviously I know that's very difficult to, you know, I appreciate that's difficult for you to kind of judge yourself, then um, you, you might be looking at a grade five. But if it was me, I would maybe, or if I were you, I would have a look at grade four. So it's not, you're going to be more than a grade three. You will, once you finish this course, you'll know more than a grade three. I've done that on purpose. I've written the course for that purpose. So you'll be more than a grade three for sure. Don't even waste your time with a grade three. 
I would start yourself at a grade four. Once you start getting onto grade five, the examiners would expect a slightly more mature level of playing. So to be perfectly honest, even though, um, here it is, even though most of the pieces in songbook three, once you've got that far, uh, let me just pick one out, for example, um, this one, for example, I don't know, even though these pieces are grade five, if not a tweak higher than that, because I like making things overcomplicated because I think people learn much better, you would need to have the maturity that goes with it. So even though you'll be able to play all of this, it's just about putting just that little extra into the music. And that's that's very hard to teach. That's what I can't teach in a course because there's no one size fits all. I can't make a course on how to, you know, how to bring out the flavor and how to put the nuances in. That's where you would then, if you wanted to push your playing higher after this course, you'd probably be better having like maybe fortnightly lessons or a monthly lesson with a teacher who can just help you bring the magic out, bring the piece alive. There's a difference between playing everything you see on here, like a robot would play it, but a robot would never put any feelings and nuances or, or anything, you know, any, any, uh, you know, they wouldn't put any color to it. It would just be playing in black and white. That's the kind of level you'll be. So you'll be at the physical level of about a grade five, but whether you'll have any colour to put into it would sort of would would be the issue. So probably somewhere around about grade four to grade five to <laughs> answer that question. Um. Okay. What is the most expensive violin you've ever played? Um. Probably the one that I'm on. Really, I've never had a chance to play anything else. But um. Yeah, a Matty would be quite nice to play, or a yeah, or a, well, everyone wants to have a go at the Stradivarius, don't they? Um, Claire, if I'm going on holiday, what kind of practice can I do without a violin during the holiday? Nothing, just have a holiday, just just leave it. Believe me, you're, you're not nothing. Nothing bad is going to come of going on holiday for two weeks. Um, so you're fine. Just you know, have a break. Um, I've got a violin, but the strings get loose quite frequently. Frequently, how often do you need to retune the violin strings? You should re you should be retuning every. Um, every time that you come to play the violin if your strings are becoming too loose too quickly too obviously loose then it, there's going to be something going on with the peg box so I would maybe want to want to have a look at that if you've got something more on the lines of a cheaper violin kind of hundred dollars or less something like that then that can be an issue with those but you might be able to fix that with a bit a bit of peg paste but your violin you should be tuning it every time you you play the violin and it shouldn't be going too badly out of tune. And if it is, then there's going to be something, you know, uh, more of an issue. Um, OK, a few minutes left before we finish. Let me just I can see that I've got some more questions. I'm just going to answer the ones that I can answer quickly. I can see I've got one about staccato. I might have to answer that that next week. Um Janita, how do you know when you're ready for the next position on the violin? I think it's third position, third position, first position, and then the next is third. Um, it, it depends. Difficult question to answer because I don't really know any background. It depends on what you're doing. The easy answer to that would be when you are, when you're learning my course, when you're going through a one to 30 violin course, um, I put you on third position at lesson 21. So however long it's take you to get up to lesson 21, impossible to say how long is a piece of string. But when you get up to lesson 21, that's when I start putting you on third position because I think you've done everything that you need to have done there. So it's 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 a bit of a difficult question for me to answer because it's not like you need to have done this, this and this and this to be able to move on to third position. It's more of a more of a kind of a cumulative effect. So that's why I've particularly put it in that book. But I guess you are ready when when you've learned all the first finger positions, but then also when you've when you've learned to 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 play a little bit more beyond the basics as well. So this is why it's kind of a little bit more complicated. There isn't kind of a particular checklist that you have to have done this, this and this in order to move on to third position. But I guess if you feel ready to move on to third position, then you know, you can move on to third position. There's plenty of third position books on Google that, that you can get. Um, okay, uh, what else have we got left? My uh, 16 gym, my teacher just started 
uh, teacher vibrato in last week's lesson. How long usually takes if I'm practicing an hour daily? Months. Months and months and months and months and months and months and months. It's going to take you a really, 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 really long time. Anybody that tells you otherwise is lying. <laughs> it's going to take you a long time to nail it. But the one thing I can say is stay consistent. You've got to fight through that garbage. You're going to sound like a wailing siren for many, many, many months. But if you stop and you don't break through that, you will never get vibrato. But it will take you a very long time. It'll take you months to really and truly properly nail and be able to play it for long periods of time without kind of you know, playing it a little bit, stopping and starting. You want to be able to play vibrato continuously, you know, for, you know, for a really long time. A lot of people will do vibrato and it'll just be kind of, it'll be that. But what you really want So you really want to be able to play it for a long period of time without stopping and being able to uh, kind of manipulate it as well as in being able to play fast or slow to create the kind of passion that, that you want to create depending on the music. Um, okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. What do you look for when you buy a new violin? Do you have any video guys to get a new violin? I'll be honest with you that there isn't anything I particularly look for in a violin. I would, I, I, when, when I chose this one, I just said, look, this, this is my budget. Um, and that was it. I just played a bunch and I didn't, I knew what I wasn't looking for, uh, but I didn't know what I was looking for. And it generally, it, there isn't really anything that you, that you look for. You're just kind of, you're picking something within your budget, of course. So that, that is it. You're in the constraints of your budget. And then you just pick the one that, speaks to you the most really but there is there's there's no right or wrong answer with any of that um naomi please will i need lesson oh where have i just moved that materials if yes how do i get it go to the link if you're talking about my one to 30 violin course i was talking about earlier um which i think it was your question go to the link directly underneath here and click on that then it will take you to um it'll take you to my google drive and there, when you get there, click on the PDF that says start here. Once you've opened up that, it tells you everything that you need and it'll tell you where everything is and what you need. So go to that link. It'll take you to my Google Drive. Click on the PDF that says start here in big capital letters. And, and you, should, you should be off. You should be off and away. Um, I think we just got time for one more question. Crazy button masher, jam jam. Do you still play the piano? Not so much anymore. Um, no, I play the violin more, but no, not so much anymore. Um, and I don't play the harpsichord either. Um, and then one more question. YT Hind 27. I just got my violin and some of my strings don't sound right. My tuner says they're in tune, but how do I know that they are the right sound? It could be that your tuner thinks that they're um, an octave higher or an octave lower than they are so it could be that your a string or your you know your d or your g or whatever is in tune but it's the octave below it it's probably going to happen more on the lower strings like a g or a d that's very easily done you can easily tune the g string an octave lower you know the the, g, the next g down and the tuner will say that it's g but it just won't it won't sound right it won't sound right so just it, it might be that it's it needs to be an octave higher than it is but obviously just be careful because you don't want to push those strings excuse me too much um and break them um one more question what would you say is the lowest price to spend on the violin for beginner in us dollars i'd probably say around about 250 dollars it's got to be minimum 250 even then that's kind of quite quite basic but at least at least nothing on it will be rubbish nothing on it will be particularly great but you will be able to play with it and you will not be hindered by the violin the last thing you want to be doing is buying a cheap violin and the problem is half you which you can fix and half the violin that's not really what you want to be doing you want you want your violin to be perfectly fine and you are the problem. You're 100% the problem. Whatever sounding rubbish is your problem because you can fix you by changing whatever it is that you need to change, practice, getting better. The violin is more of a problem because if the violin is a problem, then it's just more annoying. It's going to cost you more money to get it fixed and all this, that and the other. So $250 minimum in English or in the UK, probably around the same, about £200, £250. Pounds. 
Um, is that it? I think that's it. Um, oh, Iggy Zorro, I really need motivation and getting back into playing. Pick some pieces that you like. Just, just don't pick anything crazy stupid. P just, just pick some songs that you like the sound of. You know, anything you've kind of heard on the radio, a popular song. I don't know. Uh, you know, Ed Sheeran song. I, anything like that. Just something. Those uh, pop songs, if you want, they don't tend to be too tricky for example so pick something like that pick some easier type music that's that's nice there's lots of there's lots of easy music that is really nice you don't have to pick easy music that's nursery rhymes um and something for children there's a lot of music that's quite easy so pop songs these days you know christmas music i know we're not quite christmas anymore but you you get my point those are quite easy pieces um, so maybe just pick something like that rather than going for something classical that's particularly tricky because then you get to the point where you're too busy focused on learning and you're not actually enjoying anything because you're you're drilling down the whole time and that can be a little bit kind of disheartening. So yeah, just go for something really easy. Okay, I think I've got through. Um, I think I've got through all of the questions I need to. I'm sorry if I've missed your question. I'm going to be doing, I'll, I'll do another one of these next week. They seem, the questions seem to be coming thick and fast. So um, I'm happy to keep doing these if you guys are just happy to keep tuning and listening. So we'll do another Q&A next week. Apologies. Um, apologies if I, I haven't got round to your question. Um, sorry, just reading a few more, more, more comments there. I'll answer everything that I didn't answer next week. And... I will see you same time next week. Thank you very much for tuning and happy new year to you all. Hope you have a nice, healthy, happy new year. Bye.